This morning, I finished watching every single pre-fight press conference and media day for every single UFC fighter fighting this weekend. And there is actually, speaking of like the weeks that we, we, we have this video out coming out every week, there's a lot to unpack with these fighters because I want to dive into the headspaces where they're at. Guys like Chris Weidman, especially so coming back after the beating that he took from his leg, coming back from the long layoff. There are some really, really interesting things, especially from a betting perspective. So these are the type of things we want to talk about because... Again, these are the things that people don't really notice about fighters, and perhaps it can give you a little bit of a head on if you're betting on fights, if you're picking fights, just watching the fights in general, stuff to expect. We're going to go through the entire card. Well, not that's not true, actually. We're not going to go. They didn't even have press conferences for the entire card. But the fighters that I want to take a look at for is Chris Weidman, Vicente Luque, Nate Landwehr, and Aaron Blanchfield. Those four had some absolute standout moments, in my opinion, and I think it's very worth listening to. To what they had to say. We're going to get into them in just a second, and timestamps will be there if you'd like to skip to any particular fighter. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another video. If you are new here, my name is Kyle. I'm your guy with too many YouTube channels. Let's start off with Chris Weidman. So the first thing I wanted to say about Chris Weidman is, shockingly, he's at this point in his career being very, very realistic, because if you would remember when Chris Weidman was coming back from his long layoff, he was being the complete opposite. He was talking about how he could compete with Israel Adesanya. He was talking that like about making an entire another run to the title. And he's 39 years old, coming off of a leg break, coming off of surgery, fighting someone out of the rankings in Brad Tavares. Like, that's just a crazy thing to think. We don't even know if he's going to be able to fight again. And this time around, after the fight that he just had, he's looking at his career a lot more realistically. He's talking about this potentially being his last fight, but he's kind of walking back on that. It's... A little bit unclear if Chris Weidman's going to retire, but he was going into this fight with the mindset of retirement. So that's another thing to take into, my, into consideration because how hungry is this guy going to be to become a champion? Chris Weidman's already made the money he needs to make. Like, he could always use more. It's not like he's like filthy rich or anything like some of these guys in the UFC, but he doesn't need the money. He doesn't need the fame. He's already accomplished so much in his career. How And he's not going to make a championship run. How hungry is he to get in the gym and train to fight a guy like Bruno Silva, a guy who does need that money, a guy who is trying to make that title run? That's a little bit worrying when somebody has retirement on the mind. And there's another thing that we really need to take a look at here and take this with a huge grain of salt, okay? Because Chris Weidman said that he's been taking a new supplement. And with USADA being gone, that would be incredibly, incredibly disappointing if we found out that Chris Weidman showed up like this killer and Chris Weidman is... <laughs> it's a horrible cheater because I was so disappointed with TJ Dillashaw when he did that, man. And there's a few other fighters too, but coming from the Ray Longo gym, I wouldn't put it out of the realm of possibility. It would just make me really sad. Chris Wyman, I, honestly, he doesn't seem like that type of guy, but he was talking about taking a new supplement. Okay, that's that's something to take into consideration there. So if Chris Wyman comes in looking like some world beater, I think we might know why. But other than that, like I said, he, he's just been opening up about his career. He doesn't know what's going to happen. He doesn't know if he's going to retire after this. He's just going to perform the best that he possibly can. And I like the fact that Chris is looking at this fight realistically, but I don't like the fact that retirement's been on his mind. And I don't, I actually, I don't like the fact that he's just fighting after a leg break. We all know he's not the same. He's old now. He should retire. I do not want this guy, one of my favorite fighters of all time, to go out like a BJ Penn or a Tony Ferguson because that's the trajectory that Chris Weidman is on. I want him to retire close to home with all the fans supporting him. Wins or win or loss doesn't matter. I, I'm not feeling so good about him after this press conference coming into the UFC bout. Let's keep going, though. I want to talk about another fighter, that being Vicente Luque. The first thing that he opened up about, he was talking about his family and how he took time off to put his family before his career. Don't, like, be, I'm just breaking down what's going to happen with the fights here. I think that's an incredible thing. I think that's awesome that he's spending so much more time with his family, right? But when you're looking at this objectively, when you're looking at this fighting a guy who wants to win as bad as Joaquin Buckley... I don't know if necessarily taking time off is the best option for a guy like Vicente Luque right now. Now, so my question is, how hard was Vicente Luque training for this? How often was he training? When he was at a fight camp, how much was he getting better, okay? And there's another thing, like, just about Vicente Luque in general. I kind of, I know, like, you may know this, I know this, but I always forget how intelligent he is. Like, he's so well-spoken, breaking down different fighters, being realistic about his career, just talking about how two different fighter styles clashes. He spends a lot of time talking about that. So when you're breaking down a guy like Vicente Luque, you got to know that he is, he's not like, like we were just talking about Chris Weidman. 
He's not being like Chris Weidman, where he's like, oh, I can come in. I'm just going to go win the title again. I'm not saying Chris Weidman said that now, obviously, but Chris Weidman was saying that. You see a lot of guys do this, and Vicente Luque is very, very understanding about where he is in his career. He's understanding about the rankings. He knows that Joaquin Buckley can... He knows the danger that he brings forth to the octagon here. It's just, I really, really like listening to Vicente Luque. It makes me more confident about him. So he also said that he has spends most of training camp, which is very interesting. I'm curious as to how many fighters do this. He spends most of his training camp working on himself and then only adapts to the style of his opponents as being Joaquin Buckley in the last couple weeks. I actually think it's a really good way to go about fight camp. And I'd be curious if anybody knows down below, please let me know because I have no idea if this is a common thing that fighters do, because I think that is an awesome way to go about training camp. You're making yourself better, and then when the, it comes time for the fight, you are adjusting your style. It's like, okay, Joaquin Buckley does this really well. I'm going to counter it this way. Another thing we were worried about is, of course, the brain bleed. That is why I am not picking Vicente Luque to win this fight. I don't know how his health is, and he said that his health is 100%. He's perfect, ready to go, but I don't know how much I can really take a look into that and just trust him because... If he says, oh, well, my brain's still bleeding, then the commission will never let him fight. Either that or, of course, like, you don't want Joaquin Buckley to get a mental edge on you in that sense. Or, hey, maybe if I punch him, his lights will go out. I don't know. I'm just saying. He says, according to Vicente Luque, he is 100% healthy, but I'm still not feeling good about a guy coming off of a brain bleed. You know? That's just something to take into consideration. And the other thing that he spoke about, speaking of that brain bleed, is while he had the brain bleed... He ended up getting really, really close to God, and I'm not here to lecture you on about all of that stuff, but something we were talking about with Rosen Amunas last week, historically, when people in general, and especially fighters, end up really, really focusing on themselves, getting into religion, getting closer to God, they become more disciplined and healthier, they start, they, they are more focused on their fight camp because they're not really getting into the temptations of the outside world. Look what we just talked about with Rosen Amunas. we said this last week. She was talking about how much closer to God she was and how much time she was spending praying and all that. That really means something when you're training, trying to get in shape. That And Vicente Luque, because of his brain bleed, he said that he was really, really getting into religion, going to church, praying, getting closer to God. I think that's something else that we do need to take into consideration, but there's a huge mixed bag with Vicente Luque here. Okay, he could have been not training because of his family. He <laughs> could have the brain bleed issues, but he is doing a great job understanding what's in front of him. He was talking about getting ready for Walking Buckley, you know? So there's a mixed bag with Vicente Luque, but at the end of the day, just because of the brain bleed alone, I am not confident on him. That, and he's getting a little bit older myself. himself. Next up, I want to talk about Nate the Train Landwehr. There's not too much to unpack with Nate, Nate the Train, excuse me, but he... <laughs> this isn't good because he said that he is hungrier after a loss, and then what the next person asked him was, Hey, Nate. What did you learn after that loss? And he goes, <laughs> he just said, oh, I don't want to look back on my losses. I'm just focused on getting the wins. I'm like, okay, well, this dude clearly didn't learn anything. And he's fighting a guy who can beat him the exact same way that Dan Ige beat him. Pick your shots. Stop the forward momentum. I think there is a lot to learn from his loss against Dan Ige because that was a nightmare matchup. And now we're talking about another nightmare matchup in Jamal Emmers. I hate that. Yeah, you might be hungrier to get the win, but you have to go back and learn from the performance that you just had because that was a, it wasn't a horrible performance, but it was a bad performance. It was a bad performance. You need to adapt. You need to look out for the things that Jamal Emers is going to do. That made me really, really worried about Nate Landwehr coming into the octagon this weekend. Now, guys, I want to talk about Aaron Blanchfield. There also isn't too much to unpack with Aaron Blanchfield, but she was, it, it's just like a little bit of a mindset thing. Again, this is what the whole video is about, right? Analyzing the headspace of these fighters. She was asked about possibly being frustrated or upset about what's going on with the top of the division because Alexa Grasso, Valentina Shevchenko, they've just been hawking each other the entire time. They've been fighting each other. Now they're going through the ultimate fighter and they're going to fight each other again. So there is going to be a huge, huge delay with Aaron Blanchfield, who already deserves a title fight, in my opinion, and now she's coming back and taking on another top contender in Manny Faroe, that's just risking her title opportunity, and that's a way you can look at it, but I love the way Aaron answered this question. Aaron said she just sees it as gaining experience against better fighters. She's constantly fighting these top girls. She's constantly fighting girls like Manny Faroe, for example, a great fighter in the division. She just sees it as gaining experience. She's incredibly respectful. She's incredibly reasonable. She's incredibly humble. And confident. I feel really, really good about Aaron Blanchfield coming in and getting the win this weekend. That is a great way 
when you have so many of these fighters in the UFC, think about everybody else who would have answered that question. They would have been like, oh, it's ridiculous that Valentina Shevchenko's getting another title shot. She's just going, hey, I'm fighting another top contender and I'm gaining experience. So now she's looking at this like, okay, I can make it through this girl, this tough fight. I can get a better skill set. I can be active. I can beat these contenders and they will give me more confidence and better skill set and more experience to go into a title fight against one of these girls. I think it's a fantastic way to look at things. I have been talking about for a while on this channel. I think Aaron Blanchfield is going to be champion. I think she is a fantastic fighter for the division, especially <laughs> when you talk about these divisions. You have someone like Aaron Blanchfield who really, really stands out, and this made me feel really good about her personally. Speaking of Aaron Blanchfield, though, check out this video on the screen right now, guys, if you're interested in seeing the complete betting guide for this weekend. I will see you either there or in the next video, guys. Take care.